Welcome to the Kennedy Report. I'm Kennedy Hall. Pope John Paul II versus Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. That's our topic today. But uh, first, I want to give a shout out to my friend Tim Flanders at Media Catholic. Uh, I'm going to put the link in the description to this video. He did a, a stream for Guild members, so members of his sort of Patreon community sort of thing, uh, about this idea of Marcel Lefebvre and John Paul II, the controversy and so forth. And it's really good. And I was inspired by it. This is not a response video to Tim. Tim is a personal friend of mine. We talk basically every day. I would never do that in that in that way. And this isn't this isn't me refuting anything Tim said at all. This is just me being inspired, <clears throat> excuse me, by Tim's ideas. And I wanted to offer my opinion because, you know, good friends with ideas, we kind of bounce off each other. So that's kind of what I'm doing here. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. But first, please like this video, subscribe to this channel, click the links in the description, uh, go to our website, sign up on the email list and so on and so forth. You know the deal. Thanks for all your support. Now, why did I call this Pope John Paul II versus Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre? And the reason is, is because personally, I think the biggest stumbling block for Catholics of goodwill, and I'm saying of goodwill, good faithful Catholics in sort of the Novus Ordo world or sort of dabbling in tradition, I think the biggest stumbling block is the, well, are the persons of Marcel Lefebvre and John Paul II. And the reason is the following. If you believe the traditionalist narrative, which is very compelling, which I believe and whatever that means with the traditionalist narrative, broad strokes, generally speaking, if you believe that, then you run up to this impasse where the sort of mainstream church in the conservative sense heralds John Paul II in sort of an excessive way. You know, he's, you know, a goodness gracious. I mean, I think back to when I was a, you know, a conservative Catholic, whatever that means. And, and John Paul II was like the second coming of Jesus Christ. I mean, it was everything. It was, well, St. John Paul the Great said this. St. John Paul the Great said that. And it's like, uh, that's, that's great. But I mean, he was Pope for like 20 years. I mean, <laughs> whatever it was. I mean, there were like 19 centuries before that. Maybe there could be some other things. But there was this real insistence on everything John Paul II did as being basically, you know, mana from heaven coming down, you know, divinely inspired. And that the, the reality is, is that that fuels a lot of the stereotypes about a lot of the errors that have come out of the church, this hyper papalism, this basically, uh, you know, this idea that the Pope is infallible, even if we pretend that he's not, you know, um, in all cases, that is, um, you know, um, also John Paul II is the longest standing Pope after the council. So everything he did is sort of like a validation of the second Vatican council. And I remember hearing that saying, you know, uh, people would say, well, the only person who ever really did Vatican II properly was John Paul II. I wouldn't agree with that at all because I don't think anyone did Vatican II quote unquote properly because the new mass is not found in Vatican II. You know, so that's, that's a big problem. Um, anyway, but John Paul II is a superhero for most conservative Catholics. <clears throat> Everything is, you know, John Paul II Center, or John Paul II Avenue, or the John Paul II Family Family and Life Coalition, or you know, whatever, whatever these things are. JP2 is the guy. But then you run up to this problem as a Catholic who's trying to figure out the faith, the traditional faith, and you come to this thing where you realize when you find the traditional mass, you realize that you've basically been robbed. Uh, this this is not to say there could be no liturgical reform. Of course there could be liturgical reform. The liturgies are always reformed. But when you contrast the old mass and the new mass, <clears throat> you see a huge problem. But then furthermore, once you discover the old mass, you un you discover, if you stick with it, you discover a different church. And I'm using that in a, in a metaphorical sense. Don't worry, I'm not saying there are two churches. What I'm saying is you discover... <clears throat> a way of being Catholic that is radically different than the way that it's been presented to you. That doesn't mean all of the, the doctrines are different. The deposit of faith, you know, persists. But the emphasis on everything is different. Modesty, the theological manuals, the way of praying, um, the way of looking at the state, uh, the way of looking at courtship and marriage, um, family roles, headship of the husband in the household, um, I mean, there are so many things that are just not talked about at all and, and really in any meaningful way or in, in a full way. They're kind of dabbled with, you know, headship of the husband and the marriage is a big one. I mean, they'll talk about that in the new masses. 
paradigm, but they'll only ever talk about mutual submission without talking about the other parts. Uh, I think even when it comes to that reading on the Sunday lectionary in the new mass, it's actually optional to use the part that's, you know, controversial about the headship of the husband. Um, you know, anyway, my point is, is, is you get to this old mass paradigm and you discover with it, like basically what feels like a new religion. That's what was my experience. And that's the experience of pretty much everybody I talked to is before we were traditional Catholics, we loved the, the, the catechism. We loved the deposit of faith. We believed in the Eucharist. We were open to life. But then we discovered this other thing and we went, oh, that's really different. So then you find another hero. You find this hero who is Marcel Lefebvre. And he is the capital T, he, capital H, capital T, capital H, the hero of the old mass, the old faith paradigm. He's the one who was willing to put everything on the line, whether you agree with him or not, but he was, objectively speaking, willing to put everything on the line for that thing you've now come to love. And that creates a big problem in your conscience because you loved John Paul II because he was the conservative post-Vatican II Pope, you know, for all the issues with the CC and stuff that, you know, maybe we'll talk about for all those things. He was talking about, you know, pro-life the right way and marriage. Uh, and he was inspiring young people to go to church. I mean, there were these things that were happening. He did, objectively speaking, he did good, you know, he, he, he presented himself as, as, as quite the statesman. And people look at him as like a hero against communism for some of the things that he did. And fair enough for that. So you come to this impasse where you arrive at the year 1988 and the consecrations of the four bishops by Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. And you get to the point where <laughs> basically you have to choose between your two heroes. I really think that's an issue. You get to the point where you have to choose between your two heroes. You have to get you get to the point where you have to choose between your post conciliar hero, <clears throat> excuse me, in uh, John Paul II, and now you have your old tradition, old mass, old paradigm of the faith hero uh, that is Marcel Lefebvre, and they are at least in 1988 they're oil and water. They don't they can't. There's no there's no uh, there's no way about it there. And then you get to the fact that <clears throat> basically, uh, you know, John Paul II has been canonized. So anyway, this creates a really big problem for Catholics, because as time has gone on, we've seen longer and longer, more and more that Marcel Lefebvre was vindicated. Uh, we see the writings of, of Pope Benedict. We see uh, Archbishop Schneider. We see the the the, the friendliness between the you know, the juridical structures in Rome and the SSPX. And we see these things happening and it really creates conflict because you know, if you're a logical thinker in your mind, that you can't really hold Marcel Lefebvre as a hero and John Paul II as a hero at the same time without doing a lot of mental gymnastics. That's, that's what I think a big problem is for people. So a lot of people mi migrated towards, you know, the non-SSPX traditional circles. Well, I'll just do my traditional diocesan Latin mass. I'll go maybe to an Eastern church. Uh, I'll go to um, the Fraternity of St. Peter, or Christ the King or whatever. And fine, there's reasons for all these things. And this isn't me casting judgment on any of those decisions. But you get to an impasse now. We're under Pope Francis. This traditional thing is being stripped out from underneath your feet. And all of a sudden, Marcel Lefebvre is vindicated again. I mean, you can go back, you, you can go back to his writings in 1984 about the Indult Mass or wh whatever the year was, which was the permission for the old Mass given by John Paul II under his reign. And there's a reason why the Society of St. Pius X always called it the insult mass, or not the society, but proponents of the society, you know, called insight mass, insult mass, because it was insulting that you had to have permission to do something that you always had permission to do, which was vindicated by Pope Benedict in 2007. But also, Marcel Lefebvre said about that, and I've done a show on this before, where he said there will come a time where they'll, they'll basically tell you to give in to the spirit of the Second Vatican Council, that thing you've been resisting, because you essentially signed your life away by giving in to this paradigm for the indult mass. And that's exactly what happened. That happened to the Institute of Christ the King under uh, Cardinal Supic, where he basically said, sign this thing, saying the new mass is A-OK, -okay, or fits with your spirituality or whatever. Uh, otherwise, you get, get you don't get to do the old mass anymore. That's exactly what happened. So again, Marcel Lefebvre is the hero of tradition 
and everything he said is proven right. So even these traditionalists who sort of stayed away from the Lefebvre thing, now they're forced to come to this position where they're either going to have to choose basically to be bled out and go into the new paradigm, which they've raised their families outside of. They are not a part of it. They know that the old ways are better. They want their children to be priests and nuns. They go to where the vocations are plentiful. They have all these reasons. They're not just about incense and lace. They're real strong reasons that they have a Catholic sense. And they say, that's where the Catholicism is. I have to go there. But now that's being stripped away. So they don't even have the non lefebvre traditional option anymore. So this question comes up again. This is personally why I think the topic of, of SSPX uh, and schism and all this kind of stuff is all over the conversation right now on YouTube and things is because we're going through another kind of 1988 time. We're coming up to a major controversy when these things get taken away from us again, and then who's going to stand up and be the hero? I think that's kind of where we're going. It makes people nervous. I get that. So is there a way to reconcile the figures of John Paul II and Marcel Lefebvre? Well, I'll put it to you like this. I think one of the biggest problems is our understanding of um, canonizations. So it is not the case that in the church's history that the canonization process has always been infallible. It's just not the case. Uh, we know this from church history. Around a thousand years ago, roughly, there were major reforms in the canonization process. You can read Dr. Kwasniewski's work on this, and you can listen to the podcast by the Society of St. Pius X from their crisis series about our canonizations infallible. All of the citations and information is there. I'm just giving you the Coles notes. There was a time when canonizations were seen as, or in some cases, some canonizations were seen as dubious. And this was for reasons maybe of legend or embellishment or something. There was a very localized process and it wasn't very thorough. So eventually what we had was this stamped at long procedure where canonizations would happen in a certain way. They would be much more rare. Uh, and the reason was is because we wanted it to be that for what, whatever reason the person was canonized for, Catholics could infallibly follow the example that led to that canonization. Now, I'll explain what I mean by that. This is why, for example, martyrs are canonized. You could be a bad man for 99% of your life and die for Jesus Christ because you had a change of heart at the time of death and you, you know, chose to get shot by a terrorist rather than renounce Jesus or something. And you would be a martyr and you'd be called a saint. Why is that? Because what you're canonized for can only be good. It is only good to be martyred. So if you're canonized as a martyr, then you are an infallible example of heroic Christian virtue in that sense. Um, we see this, for example, with men like St. Augustine, who lived a terrible, well, he lived an unvirtuous life. He was very smart and intelligent, but he lived an unvirtuous life until, you know, sometime in his 20s when he converted and became a great saint. Um, but he's a saint because of his conversion. St. Paul is the same. Pope uh, St. Peter, you know, uh, basically committed something like apostasy, but he's not canonized for that. He's canonized because of his repentance and because of his martyrdom. So my, my reason for saying this is it is possible that someone could do something evil, vile, unheroic, but then later in life do something that is worth canonization. I'm going to say for the sake of argument, people who are trying to hold John Paul II and Marcel Lefebvre simultaneously, I can see where the line of thinking would go somewhere like that. Let's just say, like, I mean, Assisi was a disaster. It was basically uh, an AOK -okay of demon worship by the Pope, whether it was official or not. That's what it looked like. Come on, stop trying to, you know, don't put, uh, what's the expression, you know, don't... Uh, uh, don't give me gravy and say it's chocolate sauce because chocolate sauce, gravy is not sweet. You know, it's like it, it, we know what it is when we see it. You know, Assisi was an absolute disaster. Uh, he dropped the ball on lots of things with as far as administration of the church, Mar Mar Marcel, Maciel, and so forth, and many other things. Um, but, and then of course with Marcel Lefebvre, he treated him poorly. And the best book to read on that is actually a book called Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre in the Vatican. You can find an electronic version online for free. 
That is the one to read because you see how the Vatican under John Paul II dealt with Marcel Lefebvre. And it really was egregious. Like, and I'll give benefit of the doubt. Popes have advisors, they have counsel, they have, you know, assistants. It's clear that the people around John Paul II were very much like a worm tongue from, or like a worm tongue from Lord of the Rings. Uh, they hated Lefebvre. And the, when you read these things, they would accuse Lefebvre of, it's like, that never even happened. <laughs> You know, or like that wasn't even what he said at all, or it was totally out of context, or uh, they have they have no understanding of what he's saying or what he's doing. That's a big deal. So I'll give the benefit of the doubt for that. But it was clear that John, Martin Marcel Lefebvre was dealt with terribly by Pope John Paul II's administration. Um, and there's a reason why we have administration in the church. We have courts and tribunals in the church because the law matters. It's not... It can't, it's not the case that uh, the Pope just does it and therefore it's fine. Popes can be wrong on juridical penalties. Um, again, if there weren't, if that wasn't possible, there wouldn't be, there wouldn't be courts. You see what I'm saying? You know, and it's also possible that somebody could be a great, let's use, use a, a civil analogy. Someone could have a career as being a great judge, but they could still put an innocent man to jail because they believed in wrong information. I mean, that, that happens. Uh, so it, it is just not the case that um, John Paul II handled Marcel Lefebvre properly. It was an absolute disaster. And there were tons of Ill illegal activities, illegal suspensions and things that, or types of things that happened like that. So that's a whole other thing. But <clears throat> let's just say, sorry about that. Let's just say you're in this position where you're going, how do I reconcile Marcel Lefebvre and John Paul II? Well, here's how I think if someone wanted to try this, I don't, I don't venerate John Paul II as a saint, partly because I don't trust the post-conciliar canonization process since it changed in the 60s and especially in the 80s. Um, it's completely unreliable today. Goodness gracious, look at everybody who's canonized. Um, canonizations do not just mean someone's in heaven. That's part of it. But historically, they mean that someone was worthy of imitating heroic virtue. And there was an infallible guarantee that you could because of whatever they're canonized for. That is gone. That is completely gone. That alone makes it very dubious. Um, but if there were a reason to canonize John Paul II, you could say the reason was because of the way he persisted in his suffering. You could, you know, but, but even there, you know, I think you'd have to look at it like he was doing penance for how he had done such a poor job. You know, I mean, it is just a fact. And I know this as a former Catholic school teacher that the Assisi prayer meeting is the de facto stamp of approval for liberal Catholics around the world that Buddha and Christ are high fiving in heaven right now. That's just, it's just a fact. You can you can deny it all you want, but it's true. All the posters are in every classroom in every liberal Catholic school. And it's, you know, John Paul II is venerated because he was the religious freedom pope. And he showed that, you know, the Quran is a holy book too because he kissed it. So we can venerate their scriptures if we want. That's a fact. Um, now, people can say, well, John Paul II had a different explanation for it. Listen, I'll give you an example. I'm a father of a family. If I host an interfaith prayer meeting, in my living room, what do you think my kids will think? Follow it through, okay? It doesn't matter if I'm sitting there praying to the real God and I'm asking them to pray to the creator. It's still a massive scandal and it is spiritually abusive. And it's wrong. Um, that happened. So John Paul II was flicked, afflicted with many hardships, a severe Parkinson's. Personally, in, a, in an age where there's a restoration of the church, which will come, <clears throat> if we could guarantee that the canonization, because I'm going to say one more thing as well. People say that, you know, all these changes after Vatican II can't be reversed. That's not true because we've seen things reversed in the past. We've seen that we had people who were venerated as, as saints and then the process changed. And then there was explanation from the, uh, from the hierarchy that, um, we're under no obligation to look at these people as saints anymore. So it's not true that it can't be re reversed or reformed. That's just historically inaccurate. Um, when, when that will happen, I have no idea, but I know it will come because I know there will be a restoration. Um, 
So let's just say there gets to a point where the canonization process is a okay again. And then there's a movement to recognize uh, John Paul II as a saint. It would have to be from his suffering and it would have to be acknowledged that he suffered and to do penance for the harm that he caused. I mean, he'd, he'd be like a, a penitential saint. Those exist. You know, saints who lived bad lives and then they go off and they do penance and they're canonized for their penance, you know. Um, that's what I'll say about that. So <clears throat> I don't venerate John Paul II as a saint because I don't trust the post-canonization, post-council canonization process for a lot of reasons. Um, but even if I were trying to reconcile what I thought was good about John Paul II, which there are good things about him, he did some good things, of course. Um you have to recognize the evil that he did towards Marcel Lefebvre and the tradition in general, the evil that his Assisi meetings did meeting. Cause did he do two? Benedict did two, I think. Anyway, you have to recognize, this is a fact. You have to recognize these things while at the same time, recognizing that in a world of extreme leftist modernism, he definitely was kind of a stopgap in some way. So praise be to God for that. And that he did die in a very heroic way. He did. I mean, he persisted until the end and he gave an example. He did give an example of persistence in virtue for the faith. You know, John Paul or Pope Benedict could take a page from his book. Pope Benedict is old and frail. It would, I mean, there are reasons why, okay, it'd be difficult to be Pope and the people around you, you know, can't be led by you, whatever, when you're super old. But, but if we saw... Pope Benedict persisting and really showing us like, you know, barely being able to, you know, lift up the host for consecration because he's so old and frail. That's extremely powerful. And I think that John Paul II did offer that. Ultimately, I think it's clear that John Paul II was on the wrong side of the traditional Catholic thing of the Marcel Lefebvre thing. Um, but I, I hope this is helpful for people. Uh, that you don't have to walk around with resentment in your heart towards John Paul II because he was wrong on Lefebvre or a, a bad on Assisi. You don't have to. I mean, whatever. I mean, you can. There's no point in walking around with resentment in your heart. And ultimately, Christ is the head of the church. Christ is in charge of the church. And in God's infinite wisdom, there was an example in. John Paul II, where he did push through suffering and was sort of like a walking act of penance for the errors that had taken place since the council. And, and I, I think that's venerable, if that makes sense, at least from a natural perspective. I don't know. I hope that helps. Um, there will come a time very soon, very soon, faster than you think, when we'll be in another position where the spirit of Marcel Lefebvre will be on display, whether it's through consecrations or excommunications. I mean, we're heading to an impasse again, where it is clear with Pope Francis's words, for example, you know, he says being a traditionalist is basically like a showing infidelity to the church. You know, we're in a position now where it's going to be the proverbial rock in a hard place and there will be no wiggle room and there will be schisms and impasses, whether they're official or not, who knows. But that's what we're coming to. And it will be just further vindication of not only Marcel Lefebvre's intuition, but also his prophetic mission. Uh, you know, he was a prophet. He prophesied exactly what would happen. Uh, there are very few real prophets out there. And Marcel Lefebvre was definitely a, a, a prophet of the 20th century. And that will cause us to have to consider these things more and more. So I think maybe this is helpful in trying to figure that out. I don't know. Let me know what you think in the comments. Um, like this video, subscribe to this channel, visit the links in the description, and I'll put a link to um, Tim Flanders' episode on this. You can check it out on his guild stream. I think you have to sign up, which is worth doing. Support the man. He's a great man. And uh, that's it. This has been the Kennedy Report. Until next time, God bless.